Imagine this future. You're in your warm, dry, simple, but lovely home. You walk out the door and stop to chat to your neighbors, some of whom are tending to veggies in the shared courtyard. You carry along a wide, quiet path lined with native, bird, native trees and plants. You can hear birdsong, tui, piwakawaka, korimako, and other native birds of New Zealand. You can also hear the local kids laughing as they make their way to school on their bikes and scooters. You come to a large intersection that used to be filled with traffic, but now it's the local organic farmer's market. It's filled with diverse people who are getting what they need. Every few minutes, quiet electric light rail vehicles whiz into and out of the center. Let's go into a little more detail. You're spending less than half of your income on your housing and transport combined. Your power bills are really low because your home's been designed in a super energy efficient way, which makes a healthy, comfortable temperature easy to maintain with good ventilation. Most of your electricity is coming from rooftop solar and local wind generation that's managed for community benefit rather than private profit. You don't need to spend $8,000 a year or more on owning a car. When you leave town, there are options. Frequent, interconnected, electric, trains, buses, and ferries can get you to most parts of the islands. Even remote nature areas have some connecting passenger services. But if you do need a car, in town or out of town, you can always pick up a new, well-maintained electric vehicle through the car share services that are integrated as part of the public transport system. And you just pay for the time that you use the car. People with disabilities can easily use mobility scooters or wheelchairs to access all of the public transport. And the design of the streets is way more accessible for them, as well as the buildings. Now, there are some places that are already like this. And so we have a wealth of information about the benefit. Solar and wind generation is some of the most affordable electricity available, and it keeps getting cheaper. It's also better for resilience to have more distributed electricity generation. When there's a lot of planting in urban areas of trees and plants, it's better because there's more nature, but it's also better for water management. It helps with those severe weather events because more of the water gets soaked up by the plants. When we build at the right level of density, people know their neighbors, they know their community, and their health and happiness benefits from having those unplanned social interactions. We also know that there's huge benefits from more public and active transport. When things are designed well, and people are able to get to the places they need to go using public transport or by walking or cycling or other small, small vehicles, uh, it means there's less pollution in the air. We recently had a study that showed that tailpipe emissions, NOx emissions, mainly from diesel vehicles, have an enormous health cost in New Zealand. Uh, in fact, more premature deaths are, as a cause of these, are caused by these tailpipe emissions than even road crashes. Thousands of kids have asthma as a result of it, and there are hospitalizations that are directly related. When public and active transport are the norm, there's less air pollution, fewer carbon emissions, but also people have that opportunity to be more physically active every day. And we have a whole wealth of research that when they have that activity to get around in a moderate physical activity way, they are uh, much less likely to die from all causes, over 40% reduced death rates, lower risk of cancer and cardiovascular disease. But also kids are able to be more independent and free. They get physical benefits, they also get mental health benefits, and they're better able to concentrate at school. A large Danish study showed that walking or cycling to school was linked to kids being half a year ahead because they were more able to concentrate when they got there. Now let me tell you about a very different place, a place where I lived from age seven and a half, Southern California, a place with an almost idyllic climate, over 300 days a year of sunshine. It's mostly flat. There are a few hilly bits. When my grandparents first moved there, it was mainly still fruit orchards, horticulture, uh, wetlands, and new housing was being developed. 
My grandfather was able to take public transport. They were a one-car household, and my mom and her siblings cycled or walked to school most days. But when I moved back there in the 1990s, we lived, I went to the same school as my mom. Our house was a little bit closer than my grandparents' house. It was less than a kilometer away. But it was on the far side of Pacific Coast Highway, and we almost never walked or cycled to school. The one time, it's a picture of me and my youngest brother, Liam, and the one time my mom did let us walk and cycle to school, walk to school, uh, my brother was actually hit by a car crossing Pacific Coast Highway because a young driver ran a red light. Now, he was OK, but that meant my parents were afraid to let us walk. It wasn't until I was older, when I was a teenager, that I got to have more independence again. Uh, and this was the environment that I was walking in. This is sort of a downtown Torrance area, and it still looks like this. Walking, I was almost the only person I ever saw walking on the footpath or waiting for a bus, wondering if it was going to show up. Walking was like crossing deserts of asphalt alongside huge rivers of polluting cars. And I couldn't help but wonder, why is it like this? Why does it have to be this way? This question ended up leading to me deciding to study urban and transport planning. And I came to New Zealand uh, to, to complete that degree. The answer to that question really surprised me. When I got to New Zealand, I found that, like Southern California, most people do need it to use a car to get most places. But it wasn't always this way. We once had frequent connected bus and train services right across the islands when there was a smaller population and yet the same topography and weather. Um, the cities once had interconnected networks of electric trams. Uh, this is the tramway map from Wellington. So you could get to most places quite easily. Sometimes I hear that we can't have great public transport again because it's too expensive or it wouldn't work because our population is too small. And yet, let's consider the cost of our car-based transport system. At the moment, central and local governments spend about $10 billion a year on infrastructure. And over the last decades, most of that has been for cars, maintaining and building them. Um, roads, I should say. Um, and yet, to use the roads, you need to own a car. And the, cost, the average cost of car ownership is $8,000 a year in New Zealand right now. So the collective cost of everybody being able to use the infrastructure that we're building is $30 billion a year. And of course, you need to store your car someplace. And that takes up land. There are about three to four empty car parks for every car that's parked right now in New Zealand. The value of all that land that's collectively used to store our cars is conservatively estimated to be $20 billion a year annually. So that's $60 billion a year, and that doesn't count the health or environmental costs that we know are associated with this transport system. How did it get to be this way? What I discovered was that traffic engineering didn't really exist until the mid-20th century. Before that, civil engineering was all about managing urban water systems, and it had massively improved human health. Water engineers have to consider how to build systems of pipes that can handle infrequent rain events. So they're all about planning for peak flow of rain and water. When traffic engineering became a branch of civil engineering, it applied those very same principles to cars and trucks. So they designed wide roads to accommodate peak flows of vehicles, and they informed planning standards that required large off-street car parks be provided for the peak demand for each individual land use. And this unintentionally turned some of our most valuable public space, our streets, into traffic sewers. It's become so normal to us, we almost don't see it anymore. This is a picture from what, central Wellington, not that far away. But the vast majority of the space in the picture is roads for cars. Less than 10% of the space is footpath for people walking. And it has an impact on how people perceive the city, where if you're walking, if you're on foot, you're almost a second-class citizen, and your health and safety can be at risk if you stray from the crosswalk or uh, the footpath. And this is how we teach our kids to be incredibly constrained in the city so they don't accidentally get hit by a car. 
Now, this is a picture of botany in Auckland, and it's very similar to where I grew up in Southern California. You can see the majority of the land is used for storing vehicles, and most of it isn't being used at any one given time. Then you have incredibly wide roads. In this environment, it is basically impossible to walk or cycle or take public transport. But not everybody has a car and not everybody can drive. So those people suffer from, being, uh, from the disconnection and severance that is caused by this environment. The key observation is that people didn't choose this. This was planned to be this way for understandable reasons, but it's had unintended consequences of very high costs. The other major factor is zoning. So around the same time that traffic engineering became a thing, we had zoning rules which separated uses out. So you get entire areas that are residential and homes only. And then people have to travel to other areas where they work uh, or to get to the shops. And so in, this is an extreme picture. This is from the United States. But we have similar zoning rules in New Zealand. And this means that there's whole areas of just individual houses that don't allow papakainga or traditional Maori ways of settling. And they build in car ownership to each house. So you have to have a car to travel out of this neighborhood to access anything. Now, we can do things differently. We can do things better. Uh, in fact, we must. The Climate Commission has said that transport and urban form has to change in order for us to reduce dangerous carbon emissions. And while electric vehicles will be part of the solution, ultimately, electric vehicles don't solve many of the other issues that I've laid out here today. They don't address the issue of community severance, of the high cost of transport, the financial burden that's put on households to be able to participate, uh, and they don't address the issue of congestion or land use stuff. We know that we can use the space of our streets more efficiently. This picture shows 69 people. If they're mainly in cars, you get a traffic jam. If they're on foot or on bike or in a bus, they use up way, way less space. It's possible for us to enable more people to move around while still allowing those who need to use cars to use them. But we have to prioritize the public space for the safe and efficient movement of people, not private vehicles. We can do this by investing in high quality frequent light rail, for example, which has been proposed for Wellington. And we can also enable more homes within the existing urban area. We can make room for nature alongside that. Here's an example of what it could look like in an outlying suburb of Wellington now that's on the rail line. This is how land could be used differently if we had different priorities for infrastructure investment and if we worked alongside nature to enable management of water as well. This could enable many more homes. We could have daycares there. We have access to shops and other essentials, medical centers but also enable uh, people to use frequent public transport to access other parts of the city. Now, I don't want to pretend this is totally easy. Now, technically it is. We know what needs to change. We know the benefits that will come from it. And yet, change isn't always easy. Institutional inertia means that we need political leadership and community organizing to support the changes that are needed to free up and change the planning rules to enable more dense and diverse development, more affordable housing, more sustainable transport. If you want this future, I urge you to get involved in community organization. There are many examples where people have changed things. The Netherlands, for example, got its amazing bike lanes because people protested the death of their children on the roads. Here in Wellington, We've had uh, examples like the Coalition for More Homes and Generation Zero, youth organizations who've campaigned to change the spatial planning rules to enable more homes to be provided within the existing urban area. And we've seen campaigns for more public transport. Recently, a New Zealand poll showed that the majority of New Zealanders would think we need more investment in public transport, rail, and coastal shipping rather than new roads. But we are going to have to organize and fight to demand the change. And then healthier and, healthier and happier cities like this one can be our future.